थ्री टू वन संकेत सर वी आर लाइव नाउ यू कैन स्टार्ट द सेशन सर ओवर टू यू थैंक यू गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन आई वेलकम वन एंड ऑल टू प्रोकेर ए एच टीज मेड लाइव सी एम ईज अ साइंटिफिक प्लेटफॉर्म प्रोवाइडेड बाई मेक्लॉइड फार्मास्यूटिकल्स I am Dr. Sanket Nivale, representing Medical Affairs at McLeod's, and today we have gathered here to listen from an eminent speaker on the topic dapagliflozin bridging the gap in diabetes management with or without CV risk. A bit about the company: McLeod's is equipped with an experience spanning across three decades, has emerged as a global force with a dedicated team of around fourteen thousand seven hundred and ninety-eight professionally qualified employees worldwide. and state of the art manufacturing and r&d setup we are one of the fastest growing pharmaceutical company in india with a growing presence in more than 80 countries mcloids is now gearing to be a pace setter for the world healthcare and the eminent speaker i was referring to is none other than dr avinash ignatius sir has done his mbbs in 2001 from vijayanagar institute of medical sciences bellary In two thousand four, the doctor has done MD in internal medicine from Saint John Medical College, Bangalore, and in two thousand nine, sir passed out from DM nephro nephrology from All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, as a nephrologist for more than fifteen years of wide ranging experience in nephrology at some of the best institutions, including DM in ne nephrology from AIMS, New Delhi, expertise in treating critically ill patients with acute and chronic renal failure. patients on dialysis and managing pre and post renal transplants he has experienced in temporary permanent dialysis catheter insertion as well as real time ultrasound guided renal biopsies listed in the 30th pearl anniversary edition 2012 of marcus who's who in world of nephrology expert on ndtv he has multiple affiliations and memberships which includes european renal association indian society of nephrology indian society of organ transplantation association of physicians of india and sir has also authored multiple topics in multiple textbooks he has been a in investigator in the dapa ckd study and i'm sure with this background sir has currently uh, with uh, holding the position of senior counsel in nephrology hod at N noble hospital pune also is a senior consultant nephrologist at ruby hall clinic vanavari pune with this i would like to welcome dr ignatius sir and i would hand over the session to him for his excellent presentation over to you sir oh uh, thank you dr saket and at the outset let me thank macleods for arranging this uh, uh, talk on uh, dapagliflozin sglt2 inhibitors which are um now i think the uh, most uh, spoken about uh, anti hyperglycemic agents in today's times so slightly i changed the topic uh, from what you said uh, dapagliflozin takeaways a nephrologist perspective uh so a lot of uh, discussions have been going on in the last 5 6 years because there has been uh, a, a really Uh, exciting uh, developments which have been happening in the last uh, uh, five years after the first uh, uh, studies came out on SGLT2 inhibitors. So, being a nephrologist, always I like to highlight the problems with kidney disease. Almost eight hundred million people suffering from kidney disease worldwide. and causing about 2 and 1/2 million deaths every year and diabetes hypertension being the most common causes and almost 1 in 10 persons in most of the screening studies have found to be suffering with chronic kidney disease even in some of the uh, studies done in india and of these almost 9 out of 10 people are absolutely not aware that they even have ckd uh the prevalence and manifestation in all these populations like diabetic population almost nearly a half of the diabetic patients will have uh, chronic kidney disease detected or undetected while non diabetic kidney disease the prevalence is about 9 to 10% that's usual as one out of 10 people uh renal dysfunction kidney involvement heart failure diabetes these are uh, triad which are so closely related that 
most of the times in any person with type 2 diabetes at some stage of the other they will develop some form of heart disease some form of kidney disease and they are so interrelated uh, diabetes mellitus as we saw in the previous slide itself is a major risk factor for diabetic kidney disease again a major risk factor for heart failure and vice versa heart failure is a risk factor developing kidney disease whereas a kidney disease itself worsens or leads to development of heart failure uh, both heart failure and diabetic kidney disease lead to sodium retention which further pulls in water causes fluid retention worsening hypertension heart failure and symptoms of kidney disease so this looked a little simple so i thought i'll make a little bit more complex uh, but i'm not going to go into the details but we need to remember diabetes is not a very simple uh, problem but it is a multiple metabolic issues going on inside our body uh there is insulin resistance uh, there is lifestyle issues and diet which lead to obesity increased gluconeogenesis in the liver uh lipogenesis as diabetes progresses there is pancreatic insufficiency and reduced insulin secretion there is development of macroangiopathy leading to myocardial infarction there is myocyte necrosis uh reduced calcium handling in the muscles uh, there is dilatation of the lv leading to heart failure of reduced ejection fraction uh, further activation of uh, the sympathetic system and the ras activation uh, leads to restrictive heart disease and the heart failure with preserved uh, ejection fraction endothelial dysfunction microangiopathy chronic inflammation fibrosis and all these leading to a stiffened heart and not to forget that kidney itself is primarily a vessel if we look at a kidney it is basically composed of glomeruli which are primarily modified vessels and each kidney has about 1 million nephrons and so that's why a lot of times to say to highlight the uh, how much the kidney has endothelial surface a kidney is just like a vessel while heart is a muscle uh, and it receives about 20% of the cardiac ejection fraction every minute so anything which affects the endothelial function endothelial uh, dysfunction will also lead to or cause uh, renal dysfunction and that is why heart and the kidney go so close together not just in diabetes otherwise in other forms of cardio renal syndrome uh, looking at diabetic patients uh, if we briefly look at all the therapeutic options uh, each of them tries to address some of the metabolic a uh, disorder uh, bigonide sulfonide is acting on the liver uh, thiazolidones acting on the pancreas uh, glp1 dpp4 acting on multiple sites sglt2 inhibitors uh, acting on uh, various organs and these all have some may be variable effect on cardiac function or the renal disease but primarily the focus is on sugar control and glycemic control leading to uh reduced dysfunction or reduced uh, morbidity mortality from cardiovascular and renal disorders uh whether there is an added on independent uh, of hyper uh, hypoglycemic action any other effect on vital organs most of the studies have not had any conclusive evidence although there are large number of uh places in the metabolic system where uh, various uh, therapies can act but none of these are being addressed in the present uh, anti diabetic medications so in the conundrum of diabetes we have impaired insulin secretion so to address that we have sulfonylureas insulin uh, dpp4 and glp1 receptor agonists act on increased glucagon secretion uh, metformin again some evidence or some studies showed some cardiovascular benefit but not very strong evidence uh, thiazolidones if, uh, act on the decreased glucose uptake so increasing that uh, sglt2 inhibitors work on the kidneys uh, decrease increase in incretin effect by dpp4 agonists increase the lipolysis so these are some of the methods but uh, if you look at all the studies in the previous decades so insulin and sulfonylureas have no definite cardiovascular outcome trials and uh, there is no specific benefit as such seen of sulfonylureas in heart failure actually there are some reports where insulin has been shown to cause sodium retention and fluid retention and sometimes may worsen heart failure uh, 
DPP4 no increase risk in heart failure but no benefit either uh, GNP1 receptor agonist no increase risk modest improvement in heart failure uh, metformin has some evidence of reduced heart failure uh, mortality in heart failure patients and some good short term and long term prognosis in patients with heart failure uh, thiazolidones are well known for the their ability to cause uh, fluid retention and weight gain and uh, may be detrimental in patients who are having fluid retention and heart failure uh, sglt2 inhibitors the focus of today's discussion we will see in subsequent slides and what evidence we have so this is a summary of some of the large trials which were done in the last 5 uh, to 7 years and uh, the first four uh, studies are on glp1 agonists and if you look at the numbers they are all very large trials 6000 9000 14000 participants and none of these showed any benefit in primary cardiovascular outcomes such as mi unstable angina stroke or cardiovascular death so glp1 agonists did not show any benefit in any of the large trials then we look at the newer dpp4 inhibitors uh, again from 2014 onwards to 2016 very large trial 16000 Uh, subjects 14000 subjects again looking at cardiovascular death mi and stroke uh, the saver trial actually showed some increased risk of heart failure while the two other studies did not show any difference so no added benefit the exciting thing started when we started seeing um, the sglt2 inhibitor trials coming in and uh, they were the first studies which showed decreased risk actually these initial studies were done as a part of uh, the requirement for the us fda where any new drug uh, needs to be shown to have safe cardiovascular profile and these studies were basically designed to look at that and show that these uh, sgl2 in- two inhibitors are safe and do not uh, cause any worsening of cardiovascular mortality and uh, surprisingly when the outcome came they found a decreased risk uh, both uh, for cardiovascular death myocardial infarction and stroke and in these studies incidentally they also found that there was reduced incidence of chronic kidney disease decrease of gfr so renal outcomes were also uh, improved in the patients who were taking these studies and these were really large numbers 7000 patients 10000 patients in these trials uh, this is a more a simplified uh, view where you can see it was cardiovascular events and heart failure hospitalization in the previous studies and primarily the sglt2 inhibitors showed a sustained benefit in heart failure and hospitalizations so these studies seem to show a very promising new approach uh, for cardiovascular mortality in diabetic patients something which was really missing uh, and people started looking at these drugs much more intensely than their original plan as only as a uh, oral antihyperglycemic agent so if you look at uh, cardio renal syndrome uh, we have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction heart failure with preserved ejection fraction uh, there have been not much significant treatment options available except using diuretics to reduce the fluid component and using ace or arbs Uh, to improve the cardiovascular and renal outcomes unfortunately the usage of ace arbs has been very dismal and even if you look at the data in us the penetration is as low as 22% in some studies so with such dismal use of ace arbs uh, the hesitancy to use them probably because of hyperkalemia probably uh, because of uh, possibility of worsening renal functions or possibly just the difficulty in changing habit but the usage has been extremely low and for specifically cardio renal syndrome the it has been very uh difficult to uh, find any newer treatments which would be really uh, beneficial till the sglt2 inhibitors came along so this is a plot showing different studies which looked at cardiovascular outcome and ckd uh, this was the canvas program and the credence uh, for canagliflozin uh for dapa glifosin dapa heart failure trial declared timi and dapa ckd came uh, reasonably large trials with 2 to 8000 uh, subjects while for empagliflozin there was empareg and emper reduced uh, there is a third t- 
trial of empagliflozin which is ongoing with we'll, i'll mention it uh, towards the end of the uh, talk which probably is going to further reduce our threshold for uh, using sglt2 inhibitors so all these studies showed uh, reasonably significant uh, benefit in favor of the drug towards uh, cardiovascular outcomes and chronic kidney disease uh, this is a busy slide i will not go into detail too much but uh, this is just to kind of highlight or bring to our uh, thoughts the kind of patients which we see uh, frequently in our regular practice a 68 year old woman at high risk of heart failure with diabetes hypertension dyslipidemia coronary artery disease creatinine is 1.1 uh, slightly low gfr 55 ml per minute so she is probably in ckd stage 3 uh, a 70 year old man 78 year old man with diabetes recently it was found to have uh, heart failure caused by non ischemic cardiomyopathy creatinine is around 1 uh, gfr is okay uh, a 59 year old man with diabetes recently diagnosed uh, heart failure creatinine of 1.1 a uh, 72 year old lady with diabetes ischemic cardiomyopathy creatinine of 2 gfr of 25 so these are very uh, patients which we free, see frequently and uh, we need to assess as to how to optimize the diabetic treatment without worsening the hypertension without worsening fluid retention without worsening uh, sodium retention meanwhile uh hoping to help their renal functions and preserve their renal functions as long as possible so the challenges come again like uh, thiazolidones may increase the risk of heart failure uh, dpp4 and sulfonylureas and insulins uh if glycemic control is not adequate but then such patients elderly patients the risk of hypoglycemia has go up uh elderly lady with a creatinine of 2.0 we want to see if we can have any additional benefit of any um ohas which might improve her kidney function of uh, slow down the progression of both her heart failure and kidney disease so coming to sglt2 inhibitors they are the first class to have shown to reduce cardiovascular mortality and heart failure risk specifically and beyond glycemic control and this is the only class of drugs which has shown benefit in patients with or without diabetes mellitus and these are the ones which are now recommended the latest guidelines for patients with heart failure and ckd so sglt inhibitors look to be promising in the way they are trying to bridge the gap in something we were missing in patients with diabetes and with heart failure or ckd or a combination of all three and the recent trial of dapa ckd study also shows benefit in people who are not having diabetes so usage in patients with heart failure or ckd without the presence of diabetes which has been something absolutely uh, uh, probably we could call it a game changer in the practice uh, for non diabetic ckd or heart failure patients so how does the kidney come into the picture in whole the whole of this metabolic system so where does kidney and glucose homeostasis come together so gluconeogenesis also occurs in the kidneys and almost about 15 to 20% of gluconeogenesis can happen through the kidney and can be released into the system uh kidneys also use a lot of uh, glucose from the circulation to for its energy needs and for the amount of ultra filtration and reabsorption which happens then there is reabsorption of glucose into circulation from the glomerular filtrate so if we go back to the physiology of uh, glomerular filtration and uh, if you go back to a basic physiology uh, you will find that our kidneys filter about 180 grams of sugar every day glucose through the glomeruli and out of this almost 99% of it is reabsorbed from the proximal tubule and the remaining is reabsorbed from the distal tubule and no glucose actually comes out in the kidneys unless someone is uh, a diabetic with hyperglycemia or they have a uh, genetic defect which is extremely rare where they can lose glucose in their urine below the threshold level of um, average of 180 so this is how sglt2 inhibitors affect multiple sites in a kidney it basically this is the proximal tubular cell and which has got a sodium glucose transporter and whenever there is a molecule of glucose which is absorbed it also absorbs a molecule of sodium along with it and 
this once it is absorbed from the uh, lumen of the tubule it then is again taken and added into the blood so if there is increased glucose in the urine which is being filtered and that is being absorbed by this receptor there is an equal amount of sodium being absorbed with this receptor so if we block this receptor we reduce the amount of glucose being absorbed and at the same time for each glucose molecule which is not absorbed a molecule of sodium also is not absorbed so that is how uh, this increases natriuresis and you'll need to remember this because this is what is one of the key factors which helps in uh, the other non diabetic benefits of sglt2 inhibitors uh, so sglt2 inhibitors enhance natriuresis and this leads to reduced volume uh, so people who have increased volume benefit out of the reduced fluid retention and sodium retention this also alters the internal uh, hemodynamics in the kidney and that also leads to secondly uh positive effects on the kidney and in the macular densa where reduced delivery of sodium reduces the intraglomerular pressure by something what we call as a tubular glomerular feedback so these all multiple effects are subsequently translated into reductions in cardiovascular events preservation of kidney functions and uh, cardiovascular outcomes so patients who are put on sglt2 inhibitors some of the common clinical findings you will see reduced in reduction in plasma glucose uh the there's a negative uh, body weight balance blood pressure is reduced uh reduced glomerular hypofiltration and also uric acid levels may be reduced so this is a more uh, further effect of what happens so once the sglt2 inhibitors block the sodium glucose transporter so one side we have glycosuria and for each uh, molecule of glycosuria there is also a natriuresis or sodium loss so once there is glycosuria there is a negative calorie balance leading to a weight loss so beneficial in people who are obese or overweight uh, this also reduces the uh, lipid uh, deposits especially the epicardial fat uh, increasing the cardiac contractility and reducing inflammation and fibrosis uh, glycosuria leads to better sugar control so reduced inflammation and glucose toxicity uh, increased uric acid losses so reduced uric acid levels both low sugar and reduced uric acid lead to diminished atherosclerosis so all these finally contributing to improved cardiovascular outcome on the other side increased sodium loss leads to improved blood pressure control uh, there is a tubular glomerular feedback which reduces the uh, intraglomerular pressure and reduces hyperfiltration which is actually responsible for long term uh, damage to the kidneys and the fibrosis or glomerulosclerosis which happens in Uh, chronic renal disorders uh, there is reduced plasma volume which leads to reduced myocardial stretch this again reduces myocardial injury and reduced arrhythmias there is activation of ace2 and angiotensin receptors uh, reduced plasma volume also leads to reduced sympathetic nervous activation and all these factors subsequently lead to both beneficial renal and cardiovascular outcome so a simple blockage of sglt2 inhibitors and increasing sodium and glucose loss leads to varied benefits systemically locally multiple organs so sglt inhibitors has uh, they have been there for quite some time and it was actually first isolated from the apple bark tree in 1835 but then it was forgotten and nothing much happened uh till about uh, we had the first approval in 2018 for sglt2 inhibitors were uh, for diabetes now in 2008 the us fda made it mandatory for any uh, new uh, drugs being introduced to undergo trials to show that they are safe in the form of cardiovascular outcome trials and this needed uh, sglt2 inhibitors to undergo large trials to show that they are safe from cardiovascular outcome and these studies which were primarily designed actually to show uh, safety in terms of cardiovascular outcomes for these sglt2 inhibitors uh, incidentally led to the finding of decreased uh, cardiovascular uh, outcomes improved outcomes in the renal endpoints so these initial studies they showed 
secondary prevention in dapagliflozin for heart failure for major adverse cardiovascular events and cv death and all the sglt2 inhibitor showed similar uh, profiles this is a national kidney foundation classification for uh, chronic kidney disease and we all know they are in five stages and the three third stage is divided into 3a and 3b along with that albuminuria categories are added which uh, uh depend on normal to moderately albuminuric to severely albuminuric and these uh categories of gfr and albuminuria is used to stratify the risk categories of these particular set of patients so if you look at the initial trial the three trials which were there for canagliflozin empagliflozin and uh, dapagliflozin the declaratimi trial they were basically done in absolutely normal uh renal function with no proteinuria patients and these studies were basically designed as i uh, said for showing the safety of these drugs on the cardiovascular system before they were approved they got us fda approval for usage so when these studies showed positive effects in terms of renal outcomes and cardiac outcomes uh, investigators got excited and then they started looking at Do, would they have additional benefit so the next trial which came was credence and the credence trial uh, took diabetic patients with a gfr of 30 to 90 and uh, an albuminuria of more than 300 mg so this study showed a significant improvement in the secondary outcomes of uh, kidney and heart and uh, after this study i think it came in 2019 that it uh, it almost uh, became mandatory that sglt2 inhibitors should become part of uh, the diabetic armamentarium unless any contraindications existed uh, after that so the cut off here was egfr was 30 then subsequently dapa ckd study was designed and dapa ckd took the um, level further down to 25 so dapa ckd had patients from 25 ml to 75 ml gfr and a protein urea of at least 200 mg per day the third study empa kidney study it's an ongoing study it probably will finish by next year and in 2022 we should have data coming out of it and they have taken the bar you lowered the bar even further of egfr of uh, 20 or more in that particular trial so when we go back to these studies and look at the various uh, uh, previous oral um, anti diabetic medications so the initial studies showed uh, benefit in primary prevention also that is it reduced the development of first time heart failure and development of chronic kidney disease in diabetic patients and both these were seen with sglt2 inhibitors which were not seen with glp1 receptor agonist or dpp4 inhibitors a uh, subsequent trial like credence and dapa ckd have further uh, strengthened the role of sglt2 inhibitors by both uh, showing reduced mes events heart failure and uh reduce progression of diabetic kidney disease so number of other trials which have been there declare uh, timi trial canvas canvas r empareg so all these trials have uh, without doubt put sglt2 inhibitors ahead of all other uh, uh ohs and this probably the first and the only fda approved for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction that is also with and without diabetes mellitus and no other sglt2 inhibitor as of now has completed the study in which patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction for with and without uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus so dapagliflozin at present is the only one which has all the data in favor for both non diabetic and diabetic patients for heart failure so it offers the same novel pathway which has been specific to these uh, uh, sglt2 inhibitors and this again summarizes the same things in a little bit uh, less complicated slide of reducing the plasma volume reducing glucose down regulation of sympathetic activity uh, improved cardiac function and reduced heart failure so presently dapagliflozin is approved as an adjunct to diet and exercise for type 2 diabetes patients uh, to reduce the risk of heart hospitalization due to heart failure in patients with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease uh, heart failure 
in patients with heart failure to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and hospitalization. Uh, usually it is started at 5 milligrams and can be increased to 10 milligrams once daily. And uh, the recommended dose is once a day, 10 milligrams maximum. So coming to the recent two studies, one is DAPA heart failure and DAPA CKD study. Both of these studies were uh, running in parallel at around the same time. Uh, I was the investigator also for uh, DAPA CKD study and ours was one of the centers for this. Uh, DAPA heart failure also was going on in our uh, center, but it was uh, under the cardiologists who were running the study. So this study was done to evaluate the SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with, uh, with, with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, regardless of presence or absence of diabetes patients. And uh, it was a placebo-controlled trial. Heart failure of EF of less than 40% were randomized either to receive dapagliflozin or placebo. And the study duration was about 18 months. And they looked at the composite worsening heart failure, uh, which was defined as hospitalization or an urgent visit, resulting in intravenous therapy for heart failure or cardiovascular death. And when we looked at the uh, primary outcomes uh, in terms of... Uh, composite primary outcomes, the, the graph started to separate just even from the beginning itself. And it, it was it was highly significant towards the end of the study. Uh, again, hospitalization for heart failure is significantly less in the dapagliflozin group versus the placebo group. Death from cardiovascular causes, although uh, a little uh, high, but uh, it tended to be less in those when, on dapagliflozin. And again, uh, death from any particular cause was also lesser with dapagliflozin. And these were patients who were both from diabetes and non-diabetic population. Uh, coming to the second study which came, which was uh, uh, released last year, and uh, this study actually showed so much benefit that the uh, the board decided to terminate the study early because there was no uh, reason to continue the study till uh, completion as the difference was already so significant and they thought it was not, uh, so they decided to terminate it early. So this study was, objective was to assess whether placebo or dapagliflozin, either of those reduce the risk of renal and cardiovascular events in people with CKD with or without type 2 diabetes and those who are receiving standoff care including a maximum tolerate dose of ACE and ARB. This was a double blind placebo controlled trial and uh, we gave dapagliflozin 10 mg versus placebo to patients. Uh, the follow-up was around two and a half years and the primary endpoint was sustained uh, more than 50% EGFR decline, end stage kidney disease, renal and cardiovascular death. A uh, composite outcome of sustained more than 50% EGFR decline, uh, cardiovascular death or hospitalization of heart failure and all-cause mortality. So the primary composite at the endpoint again was significantly better with dapagliflozin. Uh, there was uh, uh, renal endpoints were again significantly uh, better with dapagliflozin. Uh, there was almost a 39% reduced uh, decrease uh, of GFR in those on dapagliflozin. Uh, composite death from cardiovascular cause and hospitalization was again better with dapagliflozin with a p-value of more than uh, less than 0 0.09. Uh, death from again from any cause was again less in dapagliflozin. Uh, what we also need to remember, these patients, the requirement was that all these patients were on maximum tolerated dose of ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And when, if you go into the details of this trial, almost more than 90% of patients have been on ACE and ARBs. And this highlights the efficacy of this drug, which showed benefit beyond ACE ARBs. And with the 90% patients being on ACE ARBs, on top of that, uh, this drug has shown benefit. In other studies, albuminuria lowering effect of dapagliflozin and in combination with saxagliflozin also has been uh, shown that dapagliflozin alone or with uh, saxagliflozin showed that adding it to uh, the existing 
uh, OHAs can be an option uh, in patients who probably have moderate to severe kidney disease. There's a derived study, which again the, is a small study, but it showed on a 24-week period the advantages or benefit of dapagliflozin. These were CKD3A uh, patients. So the clinical trials, both Emperor and DAPA CKD, expanded the population of uh, patients who benefit with SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, so patients with type 2 diabetes uh, and patients without type 2 diabetes, uh, improving glycemic control and in patients who are not on diabetes, benefits beyond glycemic control. So now from SGLT2 inhibitors being used only for diabetic patients with heart failure and CKD has now expanded to patients who have heart failure, CKD, but without diabetes. Now, one thing to remember is that all these studies have been on patients with at least mild uh, to moderate proteinuria. Uh, the DAPA CKD trial, the minimum uh, proteinuria was uh, about 200 milligrams per day, uh, the requirement to enroll while heart failure patients had an EGFR of uh, below 20 in the emperor reduced trial. Uh, why we need to remember is this is that uh, patients or subjects who have normal or uh, very minimal proteinuria generally normally tend to progress very slow. And including patients in a trial uh, of patients who don't have albuminuria would have led to uh, insufficient or the trial would have had to be prolonged to maybe three, four, five years to get adequate information out of it. So patients whose kidney disease naturally is not going to progress very fast. These are patients who don't have uh, proteinuria who are excluded from the trial. Uh, patients with active glomerular disease, uh, lupus nephritis or uh, uh, polycystic kidney disease, these were excluded from these trials. So as such, this data from these trials are primarily for chronic kidney disease patients with protein area of more than 200 milligrams per day and uh, with or without uh, presence of diabetes. So if we look at all the uh, trials which have been going on, there have been almost more than 80 trials going on, on this uh, drug. And it has been used in preserved ejection fraction heart failure. It has been used in... Uh, it has been compared with the head to head with empagliflozin and dapagliflozin. Uh, there are many other trials which are going on. Uh, then dapagliflozin has been looked at respiratory failure in patients with COVID-19. Uh, dapagliflozin effect is being looked at biomarkers in patients with heart failure. So various studies are going on. And I think in the coming years, we are going to be much more wiser as to mechanisms which we are still not aware how SJT2 inhibitors are working. Uh, so in 2019, we had the CREDENCE trial, which was for diabetic patients with protein area of more than 300. Uh, last year, the DAPA CKD came, uh, which had both diabetic and non-diabetic patients with each of of about 25 and protein area of more than 20. So this brought the bar down to GFR of 25 and uh, USR of 200. And uh, probably in a year or two years' time, we will have the EMPA kidney trial, which is looking at EGF of 20 or more. Uh, in both diabetic and non-diabetic CKD patients with a US year of more than 200. So this uh, kind of brings me towards the last slide. And uh, dapagliflozin at present is probably bridging the gap which has been existing for a very long time. And it's now recommended by most of the reputed international bodies and guidelines in the management of type 2 diabetes with cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or CKD. Uh, there are more than 350 trials and 80 ongoing trials for the roles of dapagliflozin in uh, glycemic control. Uh, it's the first and the only FDA-approved SGLT2 inhibitor for patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. And no other SGLT2 inhibitor is at present indicated or has the evidence in favor of CV death and in patients heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in people without diabetes. And we need to keep looking for more data and more trials as they come in to expand the usage of uh, SGL2 to inhibitors. Uh, there are studies which are looking at uh, the benefit of these even in glomerular disorders like Ig and nephropathy and probably we should have some more data in the coming years on uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in these roles. So with this, I will kind of uh, 
come to the end of my talk and then we can take up any questions or any comments and discussions from here thank you sir for the wonderful session uh, sir i'm sure with the evidence that you have shared along with your vast experience will definitely help the listeners in managing patients better and have better patient outcomes uh, i would request if anyone has any questions they can e use the chat box uh, to get the questions to the sir so that we can have a discussion and interactive session so until we get the questions running and uh, with your permission sir can i ask you a few questions yes dr sangeet great sir thank you sir uh, so you had been the principal investigator for dapa ckt trial so is there anything that you want to uh, you know enlighten us in terms of what is not published and uh, what has been your experience sir uh, all right Uh, so when we went for uh, this study, the one of the worries was when these studies began, there were reports about uh, uh, limb amputations and increased incidence or possibility of uh, uh, peripheral vascular disease worsening. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, in this study, both uh, the control group and the uh, study group did not have any significant difference or incidence of uh, amputation or uh, Uh, peripheral vascular disease also uh, there was a worry about ketoacidosis being happening euglycemic ketoacidosis but surprisingly there was not a single incidence of euglycemic ketoacidosis in these uh, subjects both around 4000 patients in 2000 in the control and 2000 in the study population lovely sir uh, so we have our first questions that comes in uh, about uh, kidney stones sir uh, dapagliflozin uh, is there any effect any betterment in kidney stones sir uh, as of now there is no evidence in favor of uh, using as a benefit for kidney stones uh, but uh, when we are prescribing uh, dapagliflozin or for that matter any sglt2 inhibitors uh, one of the worries is about uh, genital urinary infections and uh, people who have uh, maybe renal stones or who have had history of urinary infections or uh, they have some abnormality in the urogenital tract uh, we should kind of be a little careful and advise the patient i wouldn't say you don't prescribe but someone who has had we should advise the patient that if they develop any symptoms which are suggest of urinary infection they should come back to us uh, quickly and having said that in this trial we also looked at urinary tract infections which actually were not increased in any significant way in the study group and our requirement was that if any subject develops two episodes of urinary tract infection then we would uh, withdraw them from the sglt2 inhibitor uh, and continue to observe them in the study lovely sir sir when it comes to patients with low gfr uh, which who are eligible for dapa meaning more than 30 ml uh, per minute and uh, so how, how long would you manage these patients on dapa is there any any cut off criteria any monitoring severely required sir uh, primarily the reason why a gfr cut off was kept earlier was that these molecules depend on functioning globuli for their action and uh, as the glomeruli the number of glomeruli reduced there are number of receptors on which this could act uh, would not be enough and the thought was that glycemic control may not be sufficient but now the thought has been changing because initial uh, initially the drug came as a anti hyperglycemic drug and it has now moved away from that and there are many more added benefits and uh, sugar control is probably just one of the parts of it and as the usage and experience has been increasing uh, even in the study which we did the patients who were already on uh, dapagliflozin did discontinue their dapagliflozin if their gfr went below the cut off of 25 and in our discussion with the many other investigators and uh, uh, practicing uh, specialists they, the the thought was to keep continuing the uh, sglt2 inhibitors or dapagliflozin for as long as possible unless there was a contraindication for the 
uh, benefit of uh, uh, natriuresis for the benefit in terms of uh, reduced volume and the cardiovascular benefits of these medications so unless there was a contraindication to continue it we can continue this molecule probably till they reach uh, end stage kidney disease thank you sir uh, so we have a question coming in the chat box which is from pune uh, they are asking what is your suggestion for uti for pa- for the patients what care should we uh, should be taken to overcome it or to reduce it um one is we need to be careful with people who have a pre existing history of urinary tract infections uh, secondly uh, the general uh, urinary hygiene in terms of not holding on urine for too long uh, the moment sensation is there try to find an void uh, especially people who are with high Uh, blood glucose levels so they are likely to have much higher glucose levels also in the urine uh, so they are probably more prone to get urinary tract infections because of higher uh, urinary glucose but uh, other than this there's no specific advice in terms of uh, uh, patients with uti but for especially for ladies we do tell them to uh, when after they are uh, passing after using the toilet when they want to wash the perineum they should always wash the perineum in front to back direction a lot of times the tendency is to wash from back to front and that kind of tends to contaminate the urogenital area with uh, fecal matter so this is a simple instruction which sometimes can help reduce uh, urinary infection or recurrent infection in patients who are having frequent utis thank you sir i think that would really make a difference in a normal uh, patients uh, you know trying to uh, guide uh, guide them in uh, lowering the uti sir uh, uh, in a, another question sir in terms of uh, uh, they say even in non diabetic sglt2 is now recommended so in non diabetic also the the threshold for uh, glucose is reduced and you find glycosuria in those patients also so uh, and but there is no chance of hypoglycemia coming in these patients so uh, would this lead to any kind of discomfort in the future for patients who are non diabetic but having some comorbidity uh, the threshold for uh, urinary loss of uh, glucose is brought down but it never goes to such low levels that anybody uh, develops hypoglycemia and uh, in our complete study we had no actually no incident of hypoglycemia related to uh, dapagliflozin uh, so hypoglycemia does not occur uh, actually there is a positive uh, benefit of even for people who are non diabetics in terms of weight loss uh, because of the negative calorie effect but i just now want to highlight this put a caveat here uh, for people who are not overweight Uh, or people who are very frail or maybe are not uh, um, many times patients who are uh, chronically ill may be underweight and undernourished and their intakes may be poor so in such patients i would probably not go in for an sglt2 inhibitor because they are already in a negative caloric balance although these patients are few but when we see these patients we should probably remember to maybe avoid uh, sglt2 inhibitor in such patients who are underweight and probably nutritionally on the negative side uh, but anybody who is probably normal weight or on the overweight side would benefit from the calorie loss from uh, sglt2 inhibitors sure sir uh, so you in the in the session you mentioned about uh, uric acid also is excreted uh, so in the urine so is there is there a role do you see in the future your opinion in a uh, support of gouty arthritis uh, tomorrow with diabetes probably uh, i mean just an exploratory uh, you know question sir your opinion sir. yeah it's really exploratory it's it's just an added effect which was seen uh, that it causes urease urea but uh, to what extent it actually brings down the serum uh, uric acid level is remains to be answered a uh, similar effect was seen with the um uh, uh, one of the arbs uh, i it somehow is on the tip of the tongue but i can't recall it but we would not see a, a systemic whether we would see a really a systemic drop in uric acid levels to significantly use it as a 
therapeutic option uh, second thing uric acid is also a part of the metabolic syndrome and a lot of times sglt2 inhibitors would also have a beneficial effect on S- uh, on uh, metabolic syndrome uh, from the terms of weight loss calorie loss and improving lipids and in turn also probably having a positive effect on uh, uric acid now would that uric acid drop be a result of uh, the other metabolic effects of uh, sglt2 inhibitors or is it an added effect it is yet to be it's again my thoughts on it we don't know the science behind it yet thank you sir great sir i think uh, we have taken much of your time sir and you have answered our questions comprehensively and uh, to the best of your uh, uh, knowledge and abilities sir so thank you sir for the uh, firstly the wonderful and enlightening session and i'm sure the listeners would have gained deep insights in managing patient better and have better patient outcomes after you uh, using the learnings from your session so we at mcloids would like to honor your vast experience and your kind heart to share the same on such a platform for the benefit of all the current and the future listeners also sir i take this opportunity to thank each and every participant attendee who has taken time out from his busy schedule and has respected our invitation to be a part of this scientific feast sir i dr sanket nevale representing medical team at mcloids pharmaceuticals on behalf of the marketing and the sales team i would like to thank you for supporting us in this scientific endeavor and i wish you a great evening ahead sir thank you thank you dr sanket and thank you mcloids thank you thank you sir So thank you sir from here i'm ending the meeting now thank you yes thank you thank you